Hello and welcome to chapter 20 in healthcare supervision. We're going to discuss how to arrange and conduct effective meetings. We're going to start in the text on page 337 under the section labeled Let's Schedule a Meeting. Whenever a meeting of any kind threatens to land on your schedule, your first thought should often be some consideration of whether you can find a way to do without the meeting. Not that you will always or even frequently succeed in doing so, but the amount of management time consumed by meetings is more than enough to prompt us to ask of each potential meeting, is this really necessary? So there's two primary questions to ask when considering a meeting. First one, can a meeting be avoided? And second, if it can't be avoided, how do we make it worth the cost? So let's follow along with can a meeting be avoided? For the most part, we decry the frequency, number, and length of meetings, yet we continue to hold them and attend them in the same old ways. The majority of managers can be counted on to grumble about meetings, but many of these managers' true attitudes concerning meetings are revealed through their behavior. Managers range from those who are action-oriented people and obviously impatient with the passiveness of most meeting situations, after all, talking is not doing, to those who seem not to mind sitting and talking for hours at a stretch. The latter probably includes more than a few whom have a schedule full of meetings or who see a schedule full of meetings as a measure of their own self-importance. Before putting a meeting on the schedule, determine whether the answers to a few simple questions might allow you to avoid the meeting. Is the intended flow of information strictly one way? With people to be advised or informed, but no immediate feedback to be necessary. If so, consider other means such as a letter, memo, voicemail, email, bulletin board, or such. Two, is there a single clearly defined topic and limited number of people involved? Perhaps you can personally contact three or four people to solicit their input and then develop a recommendation that you communicate to them individually. Is the topic worth a meeting of its own? Perhaps an issue that legitimately requires a meeting can wait until it can be bundled with other matters at a regular, regularly recurring meeting. And that second question we needed to ask is, is the cost worth it? How do we make the cost worth it? Meetings are costly relative to other ways of doing business. They're not necessarily costly in terms of out-of-pocket expenditures. Their cost is reckoned largely in terms of the expenditure of unrecoverable time. The true cost of most unnecessary or questionable meetings would have to be reckoned in terms of lost productivity. What would these people be doing had they not been involved in a meeting? Only when it is determined that a meeting is need, indeed necessary should one be scheduled. And once scheduled, it should be conducted in such a way as to maximize the value from the time and efforts of the participants. Meetings often represent the best available technique for arriving at joint conclusions and determining joint actions. It is often possible to accomplish results in minutes that would require hours, days, or weeks by other means. Meetings are also essential to consultative and participative leadership styles. Joint decisions and actions take longer to formulate than do unilateral decisions and edicts. Since true two-way communication, including discussion and feedback, requires more time than one-way communication. However, the extra time spent in meetings can represent a small price to pay for the benefits afforded by the honest, open, participative style. Management by committee may be a widespread and not completely, completely unavoidable perception that falls out from the reality of numerous meetings. While a group may provide information and recommendations, however, the ultimate responsibility for any specific decision usually resides with an individual. So let's talk about the six different types of meetings. We have information meetings. Information meetings are held simply for a transfer of information. You have something to pass along to others and you choose to do this with a meeting rather than by some other means. Second, discussion meetings. The objective of a discussion meeting is to gain agreement on something through the exchange of information, ideas, and opinions. The essence of the discussion meeting is interchange. 
the exchange of information must be established between and among all participants. Then we have directed discussion. A directed discussion meeting may be appropriate when a conclusion, solution, or decision is evident. The conclusion has already been determined, yet it is not simply being relayed to the group as straight information. It is the leader's objective to gain the participant's acceptance of the solution. So in effect, a directed discussion is a sales pitch. Then number four is our problem solving discussion. This type of meeting is held when a problem exists and a solution or decision must be determined by the group. Although the answer determined by joint action may well turn out to be based on the ideas of a single participant, at the outset it is apparent only that there is a problem with which several parties could reasonably be concerned. Number five, exploratory discussion. The purpose of an exploratory discussion meeting is to gain information on which you or others may eventually base a decision. The objective is not to develop a specific solution or recommendation, but to, rather to generate and develop ideas and information for someone, perhaps yourself, but possibly your boss or some other manager, who must make the decision. And then our sixth meeting type. This is a special case. This is the staff meeting. Staff meeting may be an information meeting, a discussion meeting, or both. A staff meeting is usually held for the purpose of communication among the members of a group. Staff members may report on the status of their activities and thus each may be required to affect the one-way transfer of information to others. This meeting form is also used to solve problems, sell ideas, and explore issues, and depending on the business at hand, it may take on any or all of the three forms of the discussion meeting. So how are we going to prep for these meetings? A few of the following suggestions are most pertinent to discussion meetings con convened for dealing with specific situations. Most, however, apply generally to all types of meetings. So the first thing we want to do is define the problem. To enable a group to begin dealing with a situation, it is necessary to establish the nature of that situation. The first step then in preparation for your meeting is your identification of the meeting's intended focus. Number two, confirm the need for the meeting. In addition to what was said in our earlier paragraphs about determining the need for a meeting, it is also suggested that a decision of whether or not to involve several people in a meeting may not be yours alone. Confirming your thoughts with a few potential participants can be helpful. Three, deciding what should be accomplished. Before you convene the meeting, you should have a clear idea of what you want to achieve. At a minimum, and before calling people together, you want to be able to say whether the meeting should give you the solution to a problem, the group's acceptance of an idea, some significant decision-making information, or other such results. Number four, selecting the meeting type. Based on your determination of what should be accomplished, you should then decide what type of meeting you're going to have. Number five, selecting the participants. Again, based on your best determination of what is to be accomplished, next you need to determine who should attend the meeting. Your objective in selecting people to attend the meeting should be to secure the broadest possible coverage of the problem without overloading the meeting. Generally, the larger a group or committee, the more difficult and time consuming it is to properly serve the intended purpose of the gathering. Number six, distributing advanced information. All those invitees should receive, along with the meeting notification, all information that would be helpful in preparing for the meeting. At the very least, those invited should know both the problem and the objective. Number seven, notifying, reminding, and, notifying and reminding the participants. Written notification of the meeting should include time, place, preparations to make, or materials to bring, the statement of the problem, and the meeting's objectives. Number eight, arranging for proper facilities. The steps should seem self-evident, but too often a dozen people find they're ready to meet but have no place to sit down. If you need sizable conference facilities, make sure you secure them for the preferred date and time before your notification goes out. Number nine, preparing an agenda. For all but the simplest of meetings, you should use an agenda to guide you. 
If the meeting promises to be long and involved, the agenda should be worked out sufficiently in advance so it can be supplied to all attendees with the meeting notification. All right, so let's talk about leading a meeting. What's important in leading a meeting? First, start on time. You may want to allow some flexibility in how closely you adhere to a rigid starting time. If the meeting is a one-time affair involving a number of people who are organizationally scattered, perhaps including some who are your supervisors in the management structure, you may want to bend a few minutes on starting time. I mean, let's face it, you're not going to start the meeting without your boss, or if the CFO is attending or CEO is attending, you're not going to start without them. So it's okay to bend the time. But in the case of a regularly scheduled meeting, for instance, your monthly staff meeting held at 3 p.m. on the third Thursday of each month, begin precisely on time. The more you defer to chronic latecomers, the more likely these people are to remain chronic latecomers. You never want to, um, you know, disrespect the ones that show up on time and defer to the latecomers. Number two in leading a meeting, you want to state the purpose of the meeting. First, tell the group why they are there and what they need to accomplish. Also, give them your best estimate of the amount of time the meeting should require. Ending time can be fully as troublesome as starting time in some situations. It has been suggested that an effective way to get a one-hour meeting concluded is to schedule it one hour before lunch or an hour before quitting time. Nobody wants to sit through lunch and nobody wants to go home late, so they're likely to get things done quickly. Next one, number three, make some assignments. The common assignments for a meeting of a reasonable size, if you've got five, six or more people, is a recorder, a scribe, and a timekeeper. A recorder keeps track of what happens in the meeting for the sake of generating a written record of what occurs, so they're keeping your minutes. The scribe serves as an important purpose if you have to need if you have a need to capture points or ideas on a chalkboard or flip chart. This is talking material that may evolve as you meet, so it may not be the same as what you might embody in the meeting minutes. In a small meeting, the recorder and scribe might be the same person, but the roles are really different and the meeting as in a meeting of as few as three lively contributors could readily overwhelm someone who is trying to fill both roles. The timekeeper is a person who keeps track of the time spent on each agenda item and who keeps the group aware of where they stand relative to total allotted time, the clock, and the agenda. Fourth thing, encourage discussion. Do not allow the meeting to move in such narrow lines that valuable input is lost. Ask for clarifications of comments that are offered. Consider requesting opinions and asking direct questions, particularly of the few silent ones who may frequently populate your meetings. Remember, if you have structured your meeting wisely, then everyone who is there is there for a good reason. It is part of your job as meeting leader to do everything you can to get even the ordinarily silent people to talking. Now, exercising control. First of all, you gotta control yourself, and then you gotta maintain control of the group. So here's a list of don'ts for yourself. Don't let your ego get in the way simply because you're the meeting leader and you're automatically in control of the proceedings. Don't lecture or otherwise dominate the proceedings. The setting is a meeting, not a speech or a class. (coughs) Don't direct the others by telling them what to do or what they should say or conclude. This would almost amount to one-way communication, which is only marginally appropriate even when the purpose of the meeting is purely informational. Don't argue with participants. Discuss, yes. Argue, never. Don't attempt to be funny. What may be funny to one person may not be funny to another. The best laughs generated at meetings are those that arise naturally from the discussion. And exercising control in the group. Don't let anyone go off on a tangent and pull you away from the subject of the meeting. Granted, many legitimate problems are identified through tangent discussions, but legitimate or not, if they do not relate to the problem at hand, they're diluting the effectiveness of the meeting. 
If a legitimate problem arises, make note of it, but sideline it for action for another time or at another meeting and proceed with the subject at hand. Don't allow monopolizers or ego trippers to take over. Overall, your effectiveness as a meeting leader will largely be determined by how effectively you control the discussion of the group. All right, back to our list of leading a meeting. You want to summarize periodically. Agreement in a discussion meeting is usually not reached in a single progressive series of exchanges. Rather, agreement accrues as discussion points are sifted, sorted, and merged, and a solution or recommendation begins to form. You want to end with a specific plan. When the meeting is over, you should be able to deliver a final summary stating what has been decided and who is going to do what and by when. Far too many meetings are frustrating affairs that may feel productive while underway, but afterward leave participants hanging with a sense of incompleteness. In any event, do not let the group leave without a clear understanding of what has been decided and what happens next. And lastly, follow up. As far as your authority over the problem extends, it is up to you to follow up to determine what has been decided gets accomplished. It is also up to you to see that the minutes of the meeting, should they be necessary, are prepared and distributed. Provide later assurance to all participants that what they decided has in fact been accomplished and schedule a follow-up meeting when one should be necessary. All right, so skipping over to 345, we're going to talk about video conferencing. A video conference arrangement allows people at two or more locations to interact by way of two-way video and audio transmissions, thus enabling the conduct of meetings involving individuals located some distance from each other. It is a step beyond video phone calling in that it serves a group rather than just individuals one-on-one. Quite simply, it uses audio and video technology to bring people located at different sites together for meetings. A video conference can be as simple as a direct connection between two individuals in their own offices, or it can involve multiple persons in conference rooms at several sites. In addition to meeting face-to-face, -face, video conferencing can be used to share documents and displays such as flip charts or slides or transparencies. Many of the earliest video conferencing systems consisted simply of connected pairs of closed-circuit television systems. And while there are um, advantages, which of course the single greatest advantage is, is avoiding travel time and expense, because if you have to travel, you know, two or three hours for a meeting, it might require an overnight stay in a hotel or... You know, there's just expense involved. But there are video conferencing shortcomings. One is expense. The equipment can be costly. Other than a simple web ba webcam-based system using individual personal computers, the technology is sufficiently costly to prohibit its use in many organizations that do not experience sufficient volume to justify the expenditures. So if you're not having hundreds of video conferences a year, then it's not worth it to purchase the systems. Second issue is eye contact. Mm. Eye contact figures strongly in most aspects of interpersonal communication. However, some video conferencing systems create the impression that one who is speaking remotely is avoiding eye contact. Eye contact will often be experienced by viewers who are directly in front of the image of a speaker who appears to be talking directly at the camera. However, the view of person seeing the screen from any appreciable angle will be subject to the parallax effect, and it will appear that the speaker is looking past them. Number three, self-consciousness. Some studies of video conferencing have suggested that the presence of a video may actually hamper communication for some people because of self-consciousness about being on camera and possibly being recorded. So in summary, as with any other management tool or technique, meetings can be overused, underused, or used ineffectively. They can be expected to do so to be do they can be expected to do far too much. Meetings are certainly no substitute for effective individual decision making in the presence of proper authority and responsibility, 
or they can be denied the opportunity to serve their purpose appropriately. Whether the meetings you call are used or abused is largely up to you. Meetings are often an unwieldy way of doing business, and as such, it is easy for them to become wasteful and ineffective. However, the properly conducted meeting remains one of the most effective, available ways of accomplishing certain tasks. Whether meetings are effective or ineffective centers on the issue of control. If we fail to control our meetings, our meetings control us. All right, so again, I didn't cover every section of this um, in great detail, so be sure to read this chapter. Um, you will need to match up um, on your test types of meetings. Um, and then possibly some other things. Um, as I get ready to write the test, I'll be sure to give you some study tips in the module itself. So happy reading, happy studying.